Hi everybody, Ennis Dooling here. I hope you're all happily back from our virtual hike and you didn't get too much virtual mud on your boots. When I research and write, I am fascinated by the messy process by which events in the past become the history we read about. I like reading primary sources as if no one has read them before. And sometimes I discover that no one has read them carefully or skeptically before. I like walking the ground where events took place. I like trying to meet people in the past on their own terms with all their human quirks and failings. Let's review how the Northern Army came to fortify Mount Independence. In the late summer of 1775, the United Colonies invaded Canada in the hope that it would become the 14th rebelling colony. The Army met with success in the fall in capturing Fort Chambly, Fort Saint-Jean, and Montreal, but an attack on the walled city of Quebec on the last day of the year was a disaster and then the army was devastated by a smallpox epidemic. They retreated from Quebec in May and in June from all of Canada. On July 2nd, 1776, the same day that in Philadelphia, the Continental Congress declared the United States to be independent, the defeated army reached Crown Point and Chimney Point. In a letter to his wife, Abigail, Continental Congressman John Adams described the news he heard. Our army at Crown Point is an object of wretchedness, enough to fill a humane mind with horror, disgrace, defeated, discontented, dispirited, diseased, naked, undisciplined, eaten up with vermin, no clothes, beds, blankets, no medicines, no victuals, but salt pork and flour. But that is not the whole story. Joseph Voss, a lieutenant colonel from Massachusetts, wrote, There was never a grander retreat made than what we made from Sorel to Crown Point all the way. For I brought up the rear myself all the way and know very well. Therefore you may hear what stories you will. It is the truth what I tell you. Nations and historians create narratives to interpret their past. The retreat could have been framed as heroic. Today, we might recall the flotilla of small boats evacuating the defeated British army from Dunkirk. In this photo taken on Mount Defiance on the New York side of Lake Champlain, Mount Independence looks much as it did in July 1776. A staff officer reported that on three sides, the peninsula was surrounded by a natural wall of rock, everywhere steep and sometimes an absolute precipice sinking to the lake. It was primeval forest then, its secondary growth now, but it has returned to nature. In this magnificent painting, we're again standing atop Mount Defiance, about 700 feet above the lake. With some artistic license, it's the spring of 1777, and there is hardly a tree remaining. The demand for wood for heat and construction was voracious. It is difficult to say precisely how many people were encamped on Mount Independence. Certainly more than 5,000, in the summer of 1776. By late that fall, Mount Independence and Ticonderoga taken together were the home to more than 13,000 people, making the location one of the most populated in the country. By the summer of 1777, the number was far fewer, just a few thousand. Notice old Fort Ticonderoga on the left. It appears to be stone. It was mostly wood. Beyond the old fort were heavily fortified lines and redoubts. The bridge crossing the lake is about a quarter mile long. Notice the star-shaped fort at the high point of Mount Independence 
and the small inlet called Catfish Bay today. This dramatic photo shows the strength of Mount Independence better than any words. We're looking south at the Grand Battery, where there were 28 cannon. The largest was a ship splintering 32 pounder, meaning the gun could hurl a 32 pound iron shot a mile. To the left is East Creek, which is a dead end for ships and drains a marsh. To the right is the narrows between Mount Independence and Ticonderoga and the continuation of Lake Champlain. General Philip Schuyler decided to withdraw from Crown Point and fortify Mount Independence. He was an Albany, New York aristocrat without a title who was commander of the Northern Department. Thanks to the musical Hamilton, he is famous today for being the father of Angelica, Eliza, and Peggy, the Schuyler sisters, and for being Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law. He told George Washington, can they drive us out of the strong camp on the east side? I think not. I think it is impossible for 20,000 men to do it, ever so well provided, if the camp consists of less than even a quarter of that number, indifferently furnished, such as the natural strength of the ground. We're looking at strong ground, which is also the name of the book about Mount Independence. Here's the British view of the strong ground as they were approaching on Lake Champlain. This is one of very few early works that depict the mount, which is straight ahead in the center. The Grand Battery is at shore level. You can see the Citadel or Horseshoe Battery higher up. On the right are the many redoubts and fortifications on the Ticonderoga side. Mount Defiance is the tallest mountain on the right. We're approaching Mount Independence from the Vermont side, the east. During the Revolution, the landscape was heavily forested, broken only by a military road to Hubberton and south, which was hacked through the woods in the fall of 1776. This illustration shows action to the east of Mount Independence in September 1777. In this case, it is Americans, mostly Massachusetts militia, emerging from the woods to threaten the mount, which is held by German and British troops. Actually, most of the fortifications you're looking at were occupied by Germans. People then and now called them Hessians they were really Braunschweigers, or in English, Brunswickers. This little attack on the mount, part of a successful raid on Ticonderoga, led by John Brown of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, came to nothing. One British officer joked, it is an undeniable truth that the mount was never attacked by the rebels otherwise than by paper. The only living creature except the paper messenger, who approached it after September 18th, was a poor strayed cow that in the night of the 21st, being thick fog, caused a general alarm. This is the Southeast Battery, which faces the only road to the mount. The battery was constructed in the spring of 1777, as Americans realized they might be surrounded. After they fled, it was occupied by Germans. In your imagination, cut down the trees. In 1777, you'd see cleared ground and then dense forest. Here's the earliest map of Mount Independence, sketched in the summer of 1776. I'm sure you can't read it. You might not be able to read it, even if it was large enough. No matter how you hold this map, some of the writing is upside down. Which is to say, it is the real thing, a primary document, and not something a historian has drawn centuries later. 
This map is the work of a 20-year-old staff officer, John Trumbull. His father was governor of Connecticut. His older brother, Joseph, was commissary general of the Continental Army. John wanted to be an artist. That's his self-portrait painted when he was 21. This is a more polished version of Trumbull's sketch, which appeared in his autobiography. You'll see that independence is misspelled. Spelling, punctuation, and capitalization were much more relaxed in the 18th century, and even educated men made what we would consider to be errors. Notice the 3rd Brigade. You'll be discussing archaeology in that location. I'll be quiet and give you a few moments to study the map. John Trumbull became the great artist of the American Revolution. The history you've been discussing this week reached something of a climax at Saratoga on October 17, 1777. John Burgoyne's surrender to Horatio Gates has been called the turning point of the revolution because it brought France into the war as an ally. But it was a strange turning point. The war continued for five more years. Events in Vermont became even more confusing. Trumbull did not paint a realistic scene, even though the portraits of the individual officers are accurate. He painted the importance of the event. The painting is in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. You may have seen it in the news on January 6th during the attack on our democracy. The men depicted in the painting would have viewed that event with outrage and sorrow. I don't want you to get the idea that all old maps are primitive. This map was drawn by British engineer Charles Wintersmith. It is a work of art and of the most careful surveying. It is also so detailed in the highest resolution that you can almost climb into it and walk around. Here's a close-up of the star fort from the Wintersmith map. You can see the crane used to raise supplies from Catfish Bay and the hospital. That's the little F in the lower right corner. If I was allowed only one source on Mount Independence, it would be the Wintersmith map. We're high above the clearing where the star fort stood. The fort was burned when the British retreated to Canada in the fall of 1777, and the charred remains soon rotted away. We tell visitors to Mount Independence that they need to use their imaginations. Getting people to use their imaginations and to be historically minded is a challenge for historic sites, it's a challenge for writers, and maybe, most importantly, it is the crucial challenge for you as a teacher.